Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are going to give it a minute before uh, to allow everyone to uh, join the webinar this morning. So good to be with everyone. Can I see my panelists here? Thank you everyone for joining us. I think we have a really great crowd. Kind of wish we could see everybody's faces in a way so we could see who's all uh, the wonderful faces joining us today. So um, as people enter, I'm going to just get us started um, this morning because we have a very tight schedule. Uh, this event, is, uh, Going to the webinar portion is going to take about an hour and then at the top of the hour we plan to um, move into a Q&A session and um, we'll explain how to uh, get some questions into the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom feature. So, um, so again, good morning, welcome. Uh, I am Belinda Nixon. I am an undergrad uh, 1990 undergrad graduate of Stanford and a 94 graduate of Georgetown Law. Welcome to the financial basics for board members, how lawyers should prepare for private, public, and nonprofit board work. Um, we are, uh, I also want to take the time right now to thank our event sponsors, the Stanford Law School Office of Alumni Relations, Stanford Women on Boards, and the Rock Center. For more information about our sponsors and how to stay connected with them, please um, take a look at the post-webinar email that you will receive in the next day or two. I also especially want to thank the Stanford Women on Boards Lawyers Experience Group leaders, Carol Lamb and Justine Gottschall for their tremendous support with this webinar. Please post your questions in the Q&A and we will reserve some time at the top of the hour to answer as many questions as we can for about 15 minutes. And again, we will um, end the formal part of our webinar at close to the top of the hour to allow those of you who cannot stay on um, to, uh, to leave the Zoom. And then our panelists um, will be staying with us for an extra 15 minutes or so to uh, respond to some specific questions. Um, we are very fortunate to have to be able to offer MCLE credit uh, for this webinar. And the MCLE readings are posted on our website. And I believe um, you will be able to find a link for that um, at the uh, on our chat feature. Uh, a bit more information about the credit. Um, MCLE credit is only offered for live attendance and you must have an attendance record of at least 45 minutes on this webinar. Uh, again, you will receive an email from Stanford Law School by tomorrow with your certificate of attendance and other MCLE paperwork. Uh, the attendees, each of you are responsible for submitting paperwork to your state bar. And if you practice outside of California, you will have to check with your state bar to see if this programming qualifies. And uh, if you have questions regarding MCLE credit, you can um, email us at alumni.relations at law.stanford.edu. Again, that will appear in the chat feature. So right now, I just wanna give a warm welcome uh, to our um, tremendous and a very esteemed group of panelists. Uh, today, uh, we are joined by Mary Cranston. She is an alum of the undergrad and law school at Stanford. Uh, Mary retired, uh, she's a retired senior partner and chair emeritus of Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman LLP. Uh, she has served on numerous public boards, including TPG Inc., Visa, and Juniper Networks. Uh, we are also joined today uh, by Phoebe Yang. She is a 95 grad of the Stanford Law School. Currently, she serves on the board of GE Healthcare, and she's a board director of Doximity. 
and she's the managing director at Rockwater Ventures, LLC. And we are very fortunate to also be joined by Colleen Honigsberg. Uh, Colleen is professor of law at Stanford Law School, and she's the faculty co-director of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. So let's get to it. Um, as lawyers, uh, a lot of us, um, when we're thinking about board service, sometimes are intimidated about the um, find how much financial literacy that we would need to serve on a board. Um, do we need to be an accountant? We haven't, you know, most of us haven't gone to grad school. So oftentimes we might be intimidated by that and, and be discouraged from seeking board opportunities. And our panelists are here today to um, let us know that we should not be discouraged and that um, we can absolutely, with our legal talents and um, with a bit of um, uh, additional maybe uh, brushing up on some basic finances, be very um, ready to serve on boards. So we're gonna turn to our some of our questions. And Colleen, I'm going to direct this first one to you. Um, what fiduciary responsibilities do board members have that require them to have a basic understanding of finances and or accounting? Yeah, so I think that's a really great question that helps to situate where we're going. So um, what we're talking about here is really, well, are we able to meet the duty of care? And I think there are two good examples that kind of situate us and illustrate what you, you are expected to do. So the first would be when we're dealing with experts. Um, and you think of, you know, we all know the DGCL 141E, you have the right to hire an expert and to rely on them. But when you actually go through and read the court opinions there, you can't just blindly rely on your expert. The idea is that, yes, you can hire an expert, you can, you know, use their information, but you need to be able to stress test what they're providing you and make sure that you understand it and that you're asking good questions. So if you get, let's say, a discounted cash flow model, well, it's not that you can just blindly result and rely on whatever that valuation is. You need to be able to understand it, to ask those questions, and to really evaluate it. And so in terms of financial expertise, well, you don't need to necessarily create, be able to actually create the model and to build it out yourself, but you do need to understand enough to where you can really um, stress test it. And similarly, if you think about oversight responsibilities, well, assuming that you have a reporting system in place, you're getting information from that, you need to be able to understand that information well enough to really evaluate it, respond to it as necessary, and to determine, is this some sort of red flag to which I need to respond and mitigate? So it's really more about, can you understand the information that you're given? Can you stress test it? Can you, you know, ask good questions? You know, drill into the assumptions rather than can you create this particular, you know, exhibit, report, whatever it is itself. Um, I would also point out these are sort of general responsibilities. If we're talking about the audit committee specifically, then you're going to have a little bit more. So I think New York Stock Exchange has some commentary here that I think is helpful. And what they specifically say is each member of the audit committee must be financially literate as such qualification is interpreted by the listed company's board in its business judgment, or must become financially literate within a reasonable period of time. So, you know, what we're, when we think about this, I think there's a little bit of a difference between are we talking about an audit committee member of a public company, or are we talking about a general board member? That is great. Thank you so much for that, Colleen. And no, I'm going to- Maybe I could just jump in here. Okay. Just to give a little, pra I think that was absolutely the right answer. And just to give kind of a little practical view of how that would work out. Um, I was a poli-sci undergrad and then I had a law degree when I first started going on board. So, uh, and I had been the chair and CEO of Pillsbury for 10 years. So I was a CEO uh, with accounting reporting into me, but I was by no means a financial expert. And uh, the thing that was interesting to me is that what I really added to the board and boards are a team sport. So you will have on your board, um, financial experts, all boards have that. And you will be on that board, not because of your financial expertise, unless you have it in your background, you'll be there for other things. And you'll see almost immediately that your background will help you see risk and other things that interrelate 
with the financial skills on the board that will create greater wisdom in the board. And uh, you will, as you go on boards, you will pick up a lot of this. And as Colleen was saying, the audit committee does have a little higher standards, but it's also exactly where to learn these skills and to see how your uh, risk background, your strategic thinking will play into the financial records. And you can be educated by your other board members in the audit committee, by the accountants, by the internal auditors, and you'll really come up the curve pretty quickly. So don't be scared about this. You have things that other people don't that will make the whole uh, workings of the board just that much richer. Thank you, Mary. And I was thinking about that as you were speaking and Colleen too, um, about how the our training you know, from law school really, um, I think, factors in here when you're talking about um, uh, diving into the documents that you're receiving, asking those questions. That is part of our training. And so I think that would, it feels like it would translate very well um, to um, serving on a board and, and, and understanding the financial um, aspects of it. Absolutely. Great. Um, I'm going to move on to our next question. And Phoebe, I'm going to um, send this one in your direction. Uh, what kind of basic financial literacy should board members have in order to carry out the responsibilities that we were just discussing? Well, as um, Colleen and Mary just said, the, the role of a board member is really to be able to take the holistic view of a particular company, its purpose, its performance, its risks, its opportunities, and really assess that and pressure test that from a multiple different angles. Because most companies and even nonprofits in some level have a financial component to that, that's a big part of that, right? And so understanding the strategic position of the company, its asset management, how it thinks about value creation means that you have to be able to read the financial statements, you know, the PL, the profit and loss statements, the income statement is otherwise called, the balance sheet, the cash flow statements, and really understand what those numbers mean, less about being able to sort of run the spreadsheet, as Colleen said, and more really understanding what the drivers are. So understanding a company's valuation or worth, its enterprise valuation, or its 409A valuation, it's not a public company, or it's a private company, understanding the underlying assumptions, you know, what's driving sales, what's driving expenses, and the different components of those um, pieces, as well as how the budget actually gets created. How does management begin to spot issues or operational challenges? How does it allocate resources? How does it build and scale for uh, the future? How does it allocate capital? Um, and some of those key drivers really then ultimately give you a sense of an organization or a company's liquidity. And the liquidity is essentially the company's safety net. How much cash runway does it have? And how what's its ability to generate cash um, in what kind of time frame so that it continue to operate even in sort of you know stressful times, uh, economically challenged times. So in all of that, as you're sort of looking at these statements, it gives you a picture of both the risks and the opportunities. And most CEOs, um, most board chairs even, I would venture to say, like to see board members who are not just flagging the risks, but also thinking about what the opportunities are going forward and want to be able to help think through how to drive those. And that can play into things like mergers and acquisitions, you know, and whether we build or buy, how we think about our people, our processes, our infrastructure, our intellectual property, our customers, are we sound, are we scalable? And how do we think about that going forward, whether we want to acquire or whether we want to potentially be acquired or do we want to build ourselves? But most companies, you know, even those that are very well established companies are thinking about how they're going to grow in new adjacencies or continue to to um, exist um, and evolve as the market changes and then the demands of the market begin to change. So those are some key areas I would to say every board member should really have um, just facility around. And then of course the audit committee, you know, there are a whole host of other, other um, skill sets that, that come into play. You know, you're managing outside auditors, you're thinking about tax and tax compliance, you're thinking about 
uh, financial and data integrity, particularly with respect to strong internal controls. Um, you're thinking about cyber and you know enterprise risk management and compliance, and in some cases, ESG reporting. And so, it, it, particularly in a public company context, you know those things are really, really um, sort of paramount to the, the proper functioning of a board and particularly its audit committee. And then moving forward, how you actually forecast and think about metrics and how do you think about your earnings calls and, uh, and you know, all of those public market kinds of um, trends and forecasts and metrics that, that come into play um, to uh, set and calibrate uh, investor expectations. So those are some key areas I would say are, are important with respect to financial literacy. I think that probably sounds overwhelming. Thinking back on myself, you know, like Mary, I was, uh, I think it, where I went to uh, undergrad at the University of Virginia, it was called government and foreign affairs, but essentially a political science major and, and, and then also went to law school. So these are all things I learned along the way and you can learn it all the way along the way and, and, you know, oftentimes, if you look think back to undergrad, a lot of a lot of the brightest people in in school were the people who went off to law school. So you have everything within you to be able to to learn this. Um, and it's 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 not rocket science, but it is something that you spend some time investing in. Yeah, and, and we're going totally to get into. We're, sorry, Mary. We're, I was yeah. going to say we're going to get into a little bit about um, you know, where we can gain that information. But I saw Colleen nodding her head. Um, as you were speaking, Phoebe, Colleen, did you have anything more to add? Uh, very little. I thought that was really thorough. The one point I would make is, so when we do board training, I can't tell you how many people recently have taken my, oh, I should mention also as background, I started off my career as a CPA and then also did a PhD in accounting, or as my mom calls it, bookkeeping. <laughs> so my <laughs> background is as much of an accountant as a lawyer, but when I do training actually for audit committee members and particularly for new audit committee members, I can't tell you how many people recently I, I've had who have come to me and said, I have no background whatsoever in financial statements. My background's in cyber and that's why I'm on the audit committee. And now what do I do? And, you know, one thing I always point out is when we talk about the research, particularly for the audit committee, what we see is that when you have one CPA on the audit committee, that does seem to make a difference in terms of things like restatements. However, you don't need more than one. And that when you have two or three, it doesn't make a difference beyond just having one, but see it of perhaps having one helps in terms of understanding the audit process. And as you know, Phoebe mentioned, managing the auditor. But beyond that, you know, you can learn what you need to do. Excellent. Mary, I know you wanted to dive in. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, that I think Phoebe and Colleen have really hit kind of the landscape. But you, when you enter the board, you will have some secret sauce that nobody else does, which is many years of being a lawyer in many different contexts, in many different companies. You will have pattern recognition of risk and the interaction of strategy and stuff that other people don't. So right from the get-go, you'll be able to help. And just even figuring out the P&L balance sheet gap versus non-gap, you know, you could do that in an intense weekend if you wanted. It's much less complicated than some of the legal areas that you have mastered in your lifetime. So uh, yeah. don't think that you are going to be kind of a neophyte for three years while you figure this out. You will be great right from the beginning. Thank you so much for that, Mary. And I'm going to direct our next question to you as well. And I think it follows really well on what we've been talking about. Um, does the kind of financial literacy you need depend on the kind of company you're working with? Well, I think I think it does. I'm, you know, on a big public board, there are all kinds of other kinds of risk areas that you will already be the most valuable player in the room. Um, and so uh, the and the the public companies, especially the larger ones, tend to have at least two or three directors who are extremely financially literate experts in restructuring and other kinds of things that you'll need. So you will you definitely need to get your own head around it so you understand what they're talking about so that you can weigh in appropriately. But um, you won't have the same monkey on your back. If you're in private equity or smaller private companies, uh, which are often engaged in financial reengineering, um, it's there's a, a steeper learning curve because they're moving more rapidly and there are things that you'd have to learn. But again, you won't be expected as 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 the board member to be leading in that or really even to have in deep insights. Uh, you just need to help yourself get up the curve. And as I said before, it's not 
that complicated. And then in nonprofits, um, there are whole sets of different kinds of governance uh, expectations and things. So you have to understand the nonprofit law, but the financial financial side of it is usually a little less complicated. There, though, sometimes you really have to get up on to whether the concern is viable, whether the financials are showing that this company can succeed and proceed. So um, there's a you know a different level there. But I think um, in general, as a as a lawyer or a non financial professional, uh, it the question is really starting from the strategy and what the company is trying to accomplish and then understanding how they're financing it. Um, and then uh, your contribution will be more on the strategy side, probably. Is this the right strategy? Is this something we can accomplish? You'll have a lot of insights about uh, people management, et cetera, that other board members might not. So um, as I said, I think uh, you will be able to contribute on all three levels of these types of boards. It's, it's just a question of degree as to how much technical ability you'll need. And I think the private boards are where you need to dig in the most. Excellent. And Phoebe, so how has that factored into your board experience? You know, what, what have you found um, in the type of literacy you need and the different types of organizations you serve with? Yeah, Belinda, I appreciate the question because even within the public or private uh, company boards, I think um, this varies by industry and by what that particular company does within the, an industry. And um, in terms of the kind, the level of financial literacy that you might uh, find useful uh, in board service, what I did, I mean, to be honest, is I, <laughs> I initially, when I knew I wanted to start building out a board portfolio, I went back and found, this is going to make me sound like a dinosaur, but I went back and found my old accounting books from college. <laughs> and um, and then when I began to, I, I made a pivot out of law earlier in my career, and I began um, working in corporate development. And I remember rolling up my sleeves and learning how to run Excel spreadsheets then. And I went and bought, because all of the men in my um, in my office, I was the only woman and, and happened to be the only person of color also in this corporate development team, but they all had been to McKinsey and they'd all, you know, graduated from Wharton and, um, and they all had on their shelf a book that was McKinsey's valuation book. It's the book that um, McKinsey trains its young associates on how to value companies. So I went and studied that book and I, and I rolled up my sleeves and learned how to run these DCF discount, discounted cash flow analyses to understand valuation. You do not need that level of depth. Um, <laughs> um, and so just to, if you get really intellectually curious, you can go that route. But there are some really great courses, thankfully, out there and they're available and they're accessible. Um, you know, uh, NACD, the National Association of Corporate Directors, has a, a great a couple of really strong primer courses. They go deeper into finance, Athena Alliance. Stanford Women on Boards, the Rock Center. Um, there are lots of resources out there. And what I began to do is I just, as I was talking to people um, about board service who, you know, served in, on boards that I thought were interesting, um, the main question I asked them was, what, you know, what have you used? How, how have you, have you found this particular resource or this particular meeting uh, helpful? And I kind of got uh, some, you know, crowdsourcing around what was useful and I put together my own plan. I'll tell you the other thing that I did is once I began sitting on boards, even if I wasn't assigned to the audit committee, I would ask uh, the permission of, of the chair of the audit committee and, and the chair of the board, as well as you know just let the CEO and CFO know that I would like to sit in on the audit committee meetings when the schedule uh, allowed for me to do so. And I do that on every board uh, when I'm able because so much happens in an audit committee and you learn so much, particularly in the public board context that you're not gonna necessarily pick up in a book or uh, in a course, but you see how it applies within the context of that company. And it was, has been hugely helpful to me. I, I, the initial response is you wanna do what? <laughs> you know, and, and, and uh, but I said, yeah, that's that's exactly because I, I do learn a lot there. And um, and so those are you know some easy ways to to get started. No, I, I agree with that. I did that recently. I serve on a nonprofit board and I volunteered when they ask, you know, what committees do you want to 
it on next year at the financial committee yeah. and um, and it worked um yeah. Kali, you know you um actually um you know help uh folks who are seeking um this financial literacy so can you give us some um tools that we can use I mean, I feel obligated to note that the GSB offers a one-week class that is specifically called Finance and Accounting for Non-Financial Executives. Um, so I took, and it transformed my life. <laughs> yeah, and the participants tend to be super happy. Also, it's nice thing about that, then you get a cohort. And so, you know, you have people you can connect with going forward. Berkeley Law also has an online class that you can take that's self-paced if you are not able to come to campus for a week. And there are other sorts of online resources along those lines, too. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and Mary, do you have uh, what what did you do? Because this was when you first started on boards. I, you know, I think having lawyers serve on boards was just not it's not commonplace now. So I know it was just an anomaly back then. Well, how did what did you do? What resources did you turn to? You know, I think uh, you're right. There is prejudice against lawyers on boards. And I think it's so stupid because I think a really good strategic lawyer on a board brings somebody something to the board that nobody else has. And it is just a lot of experience with all kinds of ways that things can go wrong. And you just bring that wisdom into the boardroom. Um, so I did take that. I took that course uh, that Colleen mentioned when I was the suddenly promoted into being the CEO of Pillsbury. And it was very, very helpful because it gave me a framework from which I could then, you know, hang everything on. So I, I do recommend that if you've had absolutely no experience. Um, and uh, but the other thing I did was uh, I always tried, as as uh, Phoebe was saying, I always tried to get on the audit committee. And particularly early in my career, that was so helpful because you're like the fifth member of the audit committee, there's always room for you because nobody wants to be on the audit committee. So you can get on there and then you just watch. And just going through a couple of different companies, audit committees, gives you the whole landscape of really the governance and the perspective that you have to have. And at this point in my career, after many, many boards, I'm actually a, a qualified financial expert and I've served with the audit committee of many uh, public companies, including Visa. So and what I have that that no um, business person will ever have as an audit committee chair is I know how to run investigations. I, I know how to uh, ask questions when there's something that's highlighted. I don't have the background to myself independently, probably find really skillfully hidden fraud in the books. But if our auditors or internal auditors, if there's any question uh, as a as a, you know, 40 year litigator, um, I really do know how to ask good questions and nobody else. Um, that I've seen in any boards really has even anything close to our skill levels at that. So, uh, you know, as I said before, I think um, once you get these basics in, under your belt and it won't take you that long, um, you will be a powerful member of these committees. Thank you so much. And as Phoebe shared, and it was my experience as well, you can invite yourself to, even if you're not a member um, of a committee, you don't have to formally be a part of the committee. You can you know, ask if you can be invited to just sit and uh, sit in on the meetings. I did that um, uh, with one of the boards I serve on and uh, and asked if I could sit on the investment committee. And that was kind of my, you know, the way I, I made my way in. And then the next year I asked to be on the finance, uh, to, to serve on the finance committee. Well, um, one, other, one other quick tip. Um, once yeah. you're on board, befriend the auditors, befriend the internal audit, befriend the outside auditors. Uh, you once they're your friends, you can ask the stupid questions outside of the board. Um, they, and that's really, they were a tremendous source of training uh, during my early years. Excellent. Colleen, I'm going to turn to you with this next question. Uh, what is a financial statement? We're getting kind of more specific. We've been talking more broadly, but, the you know, we've been talking about financial statements. And so just a general overview, what is a financial statement and what are basic skills lawyers um, need in order to review these? Um, this is something I can talk about for hours and hours, and I do because I teach it. Um, but, so I will try to be really quick here. I would mention, though, if you have questions, honestly, reach out to me, email me. Um, students from like Director's College and from my former classes email me all the time. I'm very happy to, to do and to send you any of my class materials. But very quickly, I would note uh, three key financial statements. So we have the balance sheet, which is just, you know, here is our statement of financial position at a particular point in time all of our assets, which are the things that we can reasonably figure out what they're worth and that we think we're gonna get value from going forward on one side. 
and then the liabilities, which is what we owe other people. And then between those two is your shareholders equity, which is in theory, if we were to liquidate the firm today, um, you know, what the shareholders would get. Now there's a lot of issues with the way that we account for assets. So that's not actually, you know, perfectly correct, but that's our kind of theory. And the joke that we have in accounting about the balance sheet is that there's only one number in there that is absolutely correct. And that is the date. Um, <laughs> next we have the statement of cash flows. So statement of cash flows I find is like the most intuitive part of the financial statements because it's just cash in, cash out. What were your sources and uses of cash? split into three different areas. you got your operating, your investing, and then your financing. So your operating, if you are a you know net profitable company, your operating number should be positive. Um, presumably your investing number is probably negative because you're probably investing in the future growth of the company. And then your financing can be kind of either direction. Um, and then finally, we have the income statement. Now, this is the one that is, I think, the least intuitive to people, but it's also the one that you know, we typically think of as like the most important. And it is based on accrual accounting. So it's the idea that what we recognize in the income statement is um, not tied to the cash flow, but tied to the economic activity of the firm. And so if we, let's say I build, I'm a con I contract somebody, I'm going to build their deck. Um, and then they, I build the deck, I do all the materials, I do all the work, and then I send them the invoice. From a revenue perspective, you know, once I've done all the work, I get to recognize the revenue, even though the cash hasn't come in yet. But so it'll show up on your income statement, won't show up yet on your cash flow. And then your expenses are going to be tied to when you actually do the economic activity and recognize the revenue. So key thing for your income statement, that's where you get earnings per share. That's where you get net income. So kind of key measures of profitability. Um, that's a very, very short summary. And I'm more than happy to go further, but I assume nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> no, actually, um, I'm inspired to uh, take your class. Um, <laughs> I, I love to, auditors. <laughs> Come and sit in and, you know. In lieu of doing that today, I want to, I want to direct this next question to Mary, and, and it's related. Um, you know, we were talking about auditing um, and, um, you know, how does one monitor accounting, you know, issues, even if you're not an accounting expert? Yeah. Well, again, you know, the a public company and even and private companies um, do have experts. They don't expect the board members to kind of uh, gin up the deep evaluations and deep people deep double checking of the books. They have you hire experts to do that. So, you know, having an overview and how to ask experts questions is really kind of your role. Um, one of the things is that the uh, there's a difference between gap and non gap uh, when you um and and often the storyline that the company is telling the market doesn't line up very well with gap accounting. And in fact, all the investors want to hear the storyline. That's what they're really interested in. So there's there's quite a bit of judgment about, and lawyers are good at this, about whether you're actually misleading things by the way you are uh, telling the market you're adjusting the gap accounting so that they can see what's really going on in the business. And so that's that's where you can often dig in. You will understand it because it's a translation between a number and a storyline and that lawyers are very good at that. And uh, it also relates to how you uh, do your IR function, address the market um, when you're telling the market things that are going on in your business. Again, the lawyers are extremely helpful because you uh, you are used to evaluating whether something is is misleading or not. And that's that's kind of the test here. You want to make sure the company is not doing something that the market will misunderstand, and they'll will be hiding some real risk in the company that's that's not um, on the table. So that's that's one of the skill sets there. Um, let's see, um, I think uh, the other thing I would say is there are. I'm just I was just thinking last night about areas that come up again and again, and where you'd want to. Um, kind of have have your antenna up when it comes up. Uh, one of them is um, uh, the capital invested in the rate of return on investments. A lot of boards kind of um, get in trouble because they aren't uh, digging into this enough, but it's basically, is your invested capital being used wisely? And is your board double checking that by reporting back against an investment? I can't tell you how many boards have ended up pouring a lot of money down a rat hole because they're not asking that question uh, with enough uh, rigor. Another is um, keeping your eye on the leverage in the company and the covenants around the leverage to make sure that this goes into the liquidity of the company. 
But uh, it's another area that uh, every board member probably ought to keep their eye on, especially in a highly leveraged company. Um, there's um, the question of um, what your internal auditors and your external auditors are doing and reviewing and making sure that you have a good sense that they are covering the waterfront of the accounting issues in the company. If, if you're using one of the big four, it's re rarely a risk. Um, and then a strong internal auditor will also help because it's a double check on what's going on there. And you can, uh, as I said, if you develop a relationship with them and talk to them regularly, they will keep you apprised of what they're seeing in the, in the company. Um, I guess the um, last piece I would mention is um, uh, buybacks and dividends. This is an art, not a science, but it comes up in every board in public companies, whether you, the shareholders are looking for return. And especially if your company is not a rapid growth company where they're willing to just, just ride the stock up as the market grows. Uh, in order to keep investors interested, there has to be this, uh, some return in the, sh in the shorter term. And uh, buybacks are where the company buys the shares back to reduce the dilution tends to goose up the share price, all else equal, and then dividends, which is just a cash return. Uh, most companies want to do both, but it's something that uh, you want to spend a little time just getting a, kind of the, the sense of, of when it makes sense in a, in, in a company context. And you can get that by asking questions in the boardroom. These are not dumb questions about whether the, the dividend or the buyback or no dividend is going to be the best uh, to keep our, keep our quality in uh, investor base. And companies are always looking at who's investing in the company. If you see a lot of short sellers coming in or uh, companies that are interested in, um, you know, getting on the board and agitating, that's not a good sign. And you kind of want to keep your eye on that as well. And it, it uh, the question of whether you're returning enough to the shareholders is often tied into that. BB, do you, do you want to add in anything with that? No, I, I think that was very good. Um, the one thing that I would say, and, and, and I agree with Mary's statement that we lawyers know how to ask questions. We've been trained this way. We, you know, we're wired this way. What I have learned in my board service, and this really helps, I, I see some questions in the queue, which I know we'll get to, but, but the question of how do you get on a board? I think a lot of it um, as a lawyer that we have to untrain ourselves on is the way that we ask the question. So the way that you ask the question and get to the same answer might be different on a board where you're playing as a member of a team than you would if you were a litigator in a prosecutorial setting. Because uh, you never want the management team or even the rest of the board to feel like they are the enemy. You're really just trying to uncover surface risk and ensure that you know the appropriate controls and thought have gone into, you know, how we are um, assessing where we are today and where we want to go. Um, and, and it's a, it's a really protection. It's in everyone's best interest. But I think that's, that's one thing I would say in the context of, you know, having uh, on the audit committee in particular, I've, I've, I've seen this where, you know, um, people will often say to me over time, this has happened. It didn't always happen initially, but over time they say, you ask great questions. And I think part of it is just, I think about what's really, um, what I'm noodling over before the board meeting. I prepare for that board meeting. I really think about what the issues are that are troubling or potentially, you know, things that I want to raise. And I think about how I'm going to ask the question to elicit the kind of response that I need to hear from a content perspective. And so I think those are things that, you know, lawyers and particularly on the audit committee where you are really assessing risk and trying to understand operational controls, uh, financial controls, it's important to kind of think about how you do that. And I think one thing I've found, and again, I serve on nonprofit boards, not on public or private boards, but just having a general curiosity um, about the operations and functions of the organization. When you're curious about that and asking questions, which I think, again, as lawyers, we're just very curious um, and we're eager to learn as we dive in and learn about different topic areas. But I think as we express you know, um, curiosity in those areas, people realize we're just inquisitive. We're not just, you know, doing a gotcha, but we're, this is just our nature. Um, and uh, one of the other, uh, my fellow trustees was a, um, a reporter 
um, for the Washington Post. And she and I were the, you know, are the ones who are constantly, and I think people realize that we just have this natural curiosity and 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 that comes through. So I appreciate that. Um, Phoebe, I'm going to direct the next question to you. And again, we're we're getting fairly specific here. Um, especially when we're talking about public boards, um, what are some key SEC requirements for public boards? Yeah, well, Colleen may be better to answer some of these things, but I'll just say, you know, there are obviously just the buckets um, are uh, holding and disclosure requirements, uh, uh, both from a board perspective and a management perspective, but also, you know, the financial statements and and um and and the filings that need to take place um there are a whole set of you know laws regulations the dodd frank sarbanes oxley the securities exchange act of 1934 sec rules the listing standards that the new york stock exchange and nasdaq have that have their own set of uh requirements as well and um and then, you know, with respect to, for example, the annual reports and the quarterly reports, you obviously also have, you know, certified financial statements that the whole board um, reviews. Um, you know, you're looking at the proxy materials and you're reviewing it. The audit committee obviously has the heaviest lift with respect to those statements, but, you know, you're looking at the audited balance sheets and the the income statements and the cash flows and you're ensuring and you're certifying that, you know, you, uh, to the best of your knowledge, these are sound um, and the internal controls are in place to, to produce these statements. And, you know, obviously you have the external auditors at play, but as Colleen started off the conversation this morning, you know, um, the board is ultimately accountable. <laughs> so uh, those disclosures are really important. Um, and, you know, part of being on a public board, and those are the public board requirements are, you know, with the SEC that part of that is actually enjoying reading those statements I mean, on some level. <laughs> so, you know, I, it's, it's, it's uh, initially it's, it's a, it feels like a lot. Um, but once you understand the structure, the framework, you, you can, you know how to read them and much more efficiently and you know what to spot um, and what to, what to ask questions and pressure, pressure tests against. But Colleen, <laughs> what can you add to that? <laughs> Uh, well, if you don't mind, I actually also want to go back to the prior question and just oh, note yeah, things. <laughs> so yeah. just um, over the years, some of the things that have kind of filtered up that people have told me are helpful are one, um, ex looking at what external parties and third party reporting. So even if um, look at analyst reports, especially, you know, if you're a public company, if there are analyst reports, reading those can be really helpful. Um, short selling theses. So I understand people hate short sellers. Um, I understand some of them are terrible, but also the two most recent big accounting blowups that we've had, Wirecard and Luck and Coffee, both of those were uttered by short sellers. The auditor missed it. So short sellers, actually, when I read for the good ones, um, they dig more into, a, certainly I would say, accounting and auditing issues than I see from analyst reports. The analyst reports are helpful too, and they're good with like financial strategy, but some of the short selling reports can actually be really good with respect to accounting, and I would at least want to know what's out there. So those, I think, third-party reports can be a really good source of information, and also they're written in a language that people can usually understand, um, even if you are, you know, perhaps new, more newer to the area. Um, I would also look at peer companies. So what we see for accounting issues is that this very they very often come in waves. And you can think of like stock option backdating. Um, or you can think of the lease accounting issues that we saw, you know, in the sort of mid 2000s to 2010s. So and in the lease accounting issue, it was that the SEC um, updated some of the guidance for how to apply rules with respect to lease accounting. And then a bunch of companies, particularly retail companies that were relying on those rules all had to, you know, restate their financials. And so chances are your company empirically is probably not the first one to actually be restating for this issue. And so you can look and see what's going on with peer companies and that can give you some guidance. Um, you saw that with stock option accounting too. And then like the first companies that were doing it got crushed much more heavily. And then by the end, it was like, oh yeah, we've seen those a hundred times. Um, so that can be a good source of information. Um, also in terms of like where to dig in, you know, for, especially for public companies, they're going to report there in the MDNA, there will be a section describing our, you know, critical accounting estimates. And that's actually where I would dig in. 
because you know you don't need to know every single area of accounting. Um, but if something is going to blow up, it's probably one of those critical areas, and those are going to be highlighted in the MDNA. And so I would focus on one of those. Um, you can also look in the audit report now. They report CAMs or critical audit matters, and some of those can be helpful to read. I would say not as much as like the you know part in the MDNA, but it's still, especially if you're on the audit committee, worth reviewing. Um, even though presumably you would have communicated those in advance. So those are just some tips that I've heard, you know, that also are kind of helpful and that I think everybody could do. Now, I think for the last question, in terms of SEC requirements, I think Phoebe did this nicely. We can think of this in my mind, they're like three buckets. First, you have the SEC and exchange requirements with respect to committees, and that you're going to have your audit committee, um, your compensation committee, and probably your nominating governance committee. So auditing committee, comp committee, those are mandated. NomGov is, you could technically have independent directors um, from other committees as a practical matter, you know, everybody really has NomGov. And those committees um, are each gonna have their own specific task. They are have to be staffed then with independent directors. Um, also though, as you know, Phoebe and Mary have kind of highlighted, even if the official task of the audit committee is, you know, responsible for appointing the auditors, overseeing the integrity of the financial reporting process, a lot else is going to filter to that committee, whether it's ESG, cyber, et cetera. Basically, you know, if you look at a heat map, a lot of risk areas just filter up to that. Um, for comp committee, you know, in theory, they work to set executive compensation practices, but, you know, as with the audit committee, other things filter up. So recently we've seen a lot of human capital issues that filter up and that are managed by the comp committee. Um, and so, you know, ESG is kind of one of those interesting areas that spread a lot across a lot of committees. Then we've got our nominating governance committee. Um, this committee primarily responsible for board and committee succession. Um, but sometimes you'll see, you know, again, other things can filter up to this one too. So I would say that's your kind of first bucket is what are our committee requirements? If you're a bank holding company, you're going to have an additional committee. Um, finally, then second bucket that Phoebe also mentioned the independence requirements. And you know, if you are on one of these committees, you're gonna be an independent director. Um, recently, so Spencer Stewart tells us 86% of S&P 500 are independent directors. So chances are, if you're on a public company board, you are there as an independent director. And so, you know, then you just have to make sure that you meet those requirements and that you are fulfilling your obligations. Um, and then finally, again, as we mentioned, our reporting requirements. And so, you think of these as your 10K, 10Qs, 8Ks, et cetera. So, and then of course, <laughs> the SEC throws new things at us every day. And so, you know, how we deal with whatever recently is coming up, um, I guess you could make that a broader area, but I think a lot of that filters up into the reporting requirements too. Thank you for that. And as you were speaking, I was uh, especially about the different reports, like the third party reports and the short selling reports, are those widely available? So the analyst reports, you can ask your company, and I've never heard of a board that won't actually provide analyst reports to all the directors. Um, the short selling reports, I mean, they disseminate those widely because they want everybody to know. So, you know, I've never had a problem um, finding those either. I don't know if anybody else has, but. Great. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, Belinda, just, just oh, yeah. if, if if you're not currently on a board and you're looking for the investor reports, a lot of times you can um, you can find them. I mean, some of the key banks, you can see who's actually covering that particular company that you may have of interest. You can also look at what their the investors are saying about their competitors and look at those analyst reports as well. Um, and you can find them in banks. I get I get listed back from when I was in the media industry. I still get media analyst reports um, as well. So you you can people are very eager for people to read what they've written. So you can find them. Um, and uh, and you know and and sometimes companies will put put some of them on their website or links to them on their websites too. That's great. And so that actually segues really well to the next question I have. Um, and I'm going to direct this to both you and um, Mary. And um, so as you're looking to join a board, if you've been invited or you're thinking about um, boards that you might want to research, what should um, you know you consider about a 
company's finances and business operations when you are deciding whether or not to join a board? I'm going to ask Mary first. Yeah, well, that's that's a really good question. So this assumes you figured out some way to get into the, you know, being considered for a board. We can go to how to get to there in a minute. But uh, I definitely um, always interview um, all the directors and the CFO and the CEO to make sure and I investigate them a bit to make sure I feel that they are completely on the up and up. I've also, over the years, um, become more choosy about what boards I'll go on. And in my current criteria are that it has to be the market leader or have a truly innovative strategic um, idea that's going to give it a lot of headroom to potentially break out from the industry. The reason is that uh, boards that are in the sweet spot in an industry have an easier time of it. They can recruit more easily, they can finance themselves more easily, and they uh, are just generally often uh, the most pleasant of boards. When I first started though, I didn't always have the option of, of joining um, that kind of a board. So in fact, in boards that aren't in that sweet spot, your skills as a, as a lawyer can actually be even more helpful because there will tend to be more risk, more strategic issues, more more of all that stuff that, uh, you know, that we bring a lot of insight into. Um, I also uh, always read the publicly available documents, SEC documents, the the ten k, uh, just to see all the risks. I mean, because those things are they're really deadly reading because they list every possible risk that could ever even be imagined. But you can you by reading them, you can see what the real issues in that company are and see if uh, if you're comfortable with it. Um, one board that was kind of interesting was Visa. It was spun out of a consortium of banks and a it, it, highly complex industry. It wasn't at all clear that it was gonna be really viable as a public company. It, it of course has been a complete home run and it's now one of the strongest companies in the world. But uh, I did that one because it just was so interesting. You could see that potentially it was gonna be a critical asset in global finance as, as the world you know, as, as global expansion occurred. So, um, you know, it's part of it is instinct. Just are you interested in it? Does this seem interesting to you? But fundamentally, if you don't have uh, complete confidence in the CEO, CFO, and your other board directors run, that, that would be my basic answer. That's great. Phoebe, um, how did, starting out, what were you looking for and, and what do you look for now? Yeah, so starting out, it's very similar to Mary. Um, uh, you know, I really uh, took a look at what what the company did and whether I liked uh, and felt comfortable with, not liked as a personal matter, but whether I felt comfortable from a cultural standpoint, um, uh, uh, as well as a competency standpoint, um, the leadership and the other board members. Um, and with respect, as I as I got farther along, um, and the complexity of the companies that I was. <laughs> looking at um, became greater or they were at different parts of the spectrum, you know, this early stage versus later stage nonprofit. My first, my first board was a nonprofit, um, uh, but it, it was a health system. But if you know healthcare, 82% of healthcare is delivered by nonprofit entities, you know, tax exempt entities. And so it was a $5 billion revenue uh, nonprofit <laughs> company. And so the complexity of that was, was pretty high, not at the, you know, in terms of disclosure, not at the public company level. But as you're starting to look at these things, like really understanding the type of company, understanding the runway, the leadership, how they operate, whether you feel comfortable that you're going to have a good working relationship because the board is a team, the board and the management are a team. And when you sit on the board, one of the, I think, um, most common mistakes that I see new board members make um, is coming in and forgetting that they're sitting in a governance role, not in a management role, and um, not observing that line. And you've got to have a very strong respect for that line for lots of reasons, but good governance requires it, but also your relationship with the management team also requires that. And so really feeling confident in the management team um, is really important because you're not there to step in as management. Now, if you're with an early stage company and they're, the board functions for different reasons, it's not a publicly traded company, you know, board members get involved in different ways, um, closer to operation and strategic sort of advice. Um, but again, you're generally not stepping into the role of management, even in those spaces. The other thing I think about 
and I very similar to Mary is like, is this a market leader or are they, or did they have something so um, interesting from a strategic standpoint that I think they're going to have a real impact. I also think sort of strategically about the ultimate portfolio of boards that I might want to have one day because a board role is not you don't, particularly for public companies, you don't come off of those easily. You you really, it's a commitment for a period of time and it's extensive and you're in it for the long haul. And so you want to think, you know, very strategically as well as thoughtfully about how you want to commit your time, you know, over time so that you don't hit conflicts or you don't, you know, you don't end up in a situation where, um, you uh, are not able to serve for the for the for the duration of you know what what would be expected in that situation. So those are all things to think about, um, and those can be driven by you know not only what the company is today, but where it wants to be one day because it may move into adjacencies that may create you know um, uh, implications for your own board service down the road. That is awesome. And I'm taking a look at my clock and um, we're nearing the top of the hour. Um, I really want to take this opportunity to thank, um, you know, before we hop off, um, Mary, Phoebe and Colleen for joining us. Mary, Phoebe and Colleen have graciously agreed to stay on for an extra 15 minutes to answer the questions that are in the Q&A. I encourage those of you who can stay with us to put your questions in Q&A. We will try to get to them as much as we can. I took a look at, and there's a couple of questions there about um, how does one even you know, start to think about getting into board service? And, and perhaps we'll touch on that a little bit, but Stanford Women on Boards, um, has, especially the lawyers group, um, has, has had prior presentations about covering that area, about how do you, you know, make your way onto a board. And uh, so we intentionally didn't focus on that in, in this session, but um, we can touch on it in the Q&A session. So again, I wanna thank Mary, Phoebe and Colleen. Oh, there's my alarm telling me it's uh, time to <laughs> put the top of the hour. Um, and uh, so I wanna thank uh, Colleen, uh, Phoebe and Mary for joining us. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for joining us in the audience. Um, thank you for um, allowing us the opportunity to present this material for being enthusiastic and excited um, for this webinar. And I also want to thank um, the uh, people you don't see um, who are behind the scenes. It's uh, um, Pedros Chasley and Shining who have really helped um, put this together for us. And um, an MCLE reminder, uh, you will receive an email by tomorrow with your relevant uh, paperwork. And so please be on the lookout for that. And um, so right now we're going to shut down the formal part of the um, webinar and move on to the Q&A session. Um, again, thanks everyone for joining us. All right. Um, again, as I, I think, you know, one thing I'm seeing here as a recurring theme um, is how, you know, maybe just touch for us, um, Mary and Phoebe, how did you um, find your first board? Yeah, well, um, I had just become the CEO of, of Pillsbury and uh, it was, it was uh, in uh, 19, uh, it was around 1999 and uh, there was still, there was a big demand for women, uh, women CEOs on boards and uh, it was then one of those weird circumstances, which I I tell people to watch out for. Weird synchronicities will often lead you to a board. Uh, they it was a company that had gotten into trouble in price fixing, and they wanted uh, they wanted an antitrust expert, and they wanted a woman, and all the board members were CEOs, so they were kind of picky about that. And uh, so I ended up with this opportunity. Um, but since then, uh, you know, I've become more realistic about how women lawyers are going to get on boards, and it uh, you're not the first person that comes to mind because uh, there's still this prejudice that lawyers are going to just absolutely get on there and be a problem spotter and not part of the solution. So um, uh, there's a couple things to think about. One is to get really um, a kind of uh, real about your experience. If you've been in a law firm or in a company and you've managed a P&L, that's extremely helpful. Um, 
if you have really deep industry knowledge, that can be helpful for companies in that industry. Do you have, um, are you very good at very complex regulation, like in banking and some of the industries that have heavy loads of regulation. Those things can be useful backgrounds. And then the real key is using your networks. Um, figure out who you know that's around boards. Um, and uh, it takes more networking than you might think. Uh, just reaching out to people, asking their advice about how you would go about it. What happens when you do that is if they have any way of introducing you to somebody that might be helpful or it might be looking for a board member, it will, it will get things in gear and you might find some opportunities. When I when I, re I retired from Pillsbury at age sixty and I was I wanted to have a full board career, it took me a year to to flesh out my portfolio of boards. At that point, I'd been on one board while I was the CEO of Pillsbury for eight years, and so I had one board. But um, it took me a year to do that, partially because it takes a while for boards to uh, to to vet candidates. So so the key is you know this networking thing that's and. By the way, it's always more comfortable for women to network with women, but board seats are still mostly occupied uh, if, you know, 70% are male. So you have to use your male networks as well. And that's, I've seen a lot of women just kind of go too light on that side of it. That's my best advice. Thank you. I 100% agree with you, Mary, on that. Um, Phoebe, how about you? How did you make your way to your first board? Um, it was serendipitous, as as Mary said. Um, it, you know, I got a call from um, a venture capitalist who had been the CEO of a very, very large, uh, the largest nonprofit health system in the country, and his CAO was now the CEO of another uh, of another health system, which was the five billion dollar revenue health system. And he called me because I in a completely different context, I ran corporate development for a small publicly traded company and had looked at buying a couple of its companies. And we really connected. We saw the industry very similarly. We had great sort of um, uh, interactions uh, around business issues. And at some point he called me and said, would you ever entertain a nonprofit board? And I said, well, it depends on what it is. And he told me, and I said, absolutely. Thank you for that. And I really want to, you know, emphasize what Mary said about, you know, networking. Um, and and Carol Lamb, the uh, one of the leaders of the experience, the lawyers experience group for Stanford Women on Boards, often, you know, comments on how GSB um, and, and other, you know, folks who attend MBA programs, that's what they do, right? They learn how to network. They're constantly networking. And, and um, as lawyers, you know, we're like, oh, leave us alone. We want to dig into our books. And, and you know, um, that's not something we're trained on. And that is something um, I think, especially, you know, when you're in a law firm setting, um, for sure, for business development, it's very important. And you start developing and stretching yourself with that skill set. But it, I think it's very important, as you guys have identified, um, because your first opportunities came through your networks. And so it's really important to network. I'm going to turn to a Colleen and, and with a, a question that's here from our Q&A. Um, and I'm gonna shift it a little bit. Um, you know, we were talking about uh, financial statements and financial information, Colleen, and you're, you know, you've been thinking about this, you're a professor. Um, you know, are there ways um, that, you know, the presentation of financial information can be um, simplified or made more accessible um, for non-financial folks. And I know you re referenced um, some of the um, reports that come out, but is there things, are there things that companies can do to help facilitate that or people encourage companies to do? Um, so if I, I just want to be sure I understand the question. So it would be like, oh. if I am a company, I'm, reporting to my stakeholders and how can I make that information a little bit easier to process? Stakeholders and also, you know, for your, you know, board members who are, you know, who are, who don't have that background necessarily. So initially to the board members, I would say, and then beyond that. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I would say first, also bear in mind when we're reporting to the board members, there are several different accounting <laughs> systems. And so you're not necessarily looking just at the external data that is being reported to uh, the public company, you know, investors. And so like when you think of a company, so we've got the reporting system gap, um, generally accepted accounting principles that we will, you know, adhere to for things like our 10K and 10Q. 
And then we have um, internal management systems and you would want to use a lot that will, you know, have different types of information, for example, so that you can see cost level information that you're not going to give out to your public companies and also or to public shareholders um, and would also have, you know, you could very well be like accounting for different numbers a little bit differently, just depending on how you're using that information internally. So, and then finally, of course, you have tax reporting, which is going to be a different system too. So I think the first thing would be conceptually, you know, what system are we talking about? And exactly, you know, how are we defining these different terms under the particular system and how it's being reported out? Now, internally to the board, I mean, I would say if you were using line items that we see in like an income statement or a balance sheet, you know, commonly, I think it's um, you could it's fair to assume that the board members know what those line items mean. I think though disaggregating them is actually really helpful, and looking and this is actually something that um, BASB is moving toward, and so presumably in the next year or two, you're going to actually see much more disaggregation. Mm -hmm. So for example, right now we have cost of goods sold. Well, cost of goods sold might have gone up because you decided to pay your employees a higher you know wage per hour or cost of goods sold, which is, you know, helps with retention and arguably has other benefits, or cost of goods sold might have gone up because your utility bill went up, which is purely an expense, probably recurring, you know, negative. Um, and what FASB is going to have people do is break out cost of goods sold to see, like, what is employee comp? What is depreciation and amortization? What is, you know, these different categories? And so, you know, giving that level of detail um, eventually will be required to public shareholders most likely, but at least now giving that to the board so that they can better understand what's in those individual line items, I think is really helpful because there is a lot that is thrown into those cost numbers. And so, especially if you're trying to understand strategy or valuation, understanding what is variable, what is, you know, semi-variable, what is fixed um, goes a long way. And so I think the first thing would be just disaggregating those numbers. Um, and then just kind of speaking a little bit more intuitively and showing where it's coming from. That I don't know if that fully answers the question. I'm sure other people have thoughts, but yeah, that would be where I would start. No, thank you for that. I appreciate it. So we're running low on time, but I want to open up this next question um, because we have talked about public board service um, and um, uh, and there are some unique um, risks associated with that. So. Um, you know, what are some of the biggest areas of risk that um, you guys see uh, for, of serving on a public board, um, even if it's a very small public board? You know, I, I just like to start by saying, I think uh, people are very scared of the risk of public board service. And I think it's actually overstated. I mean, one of the reasons that public companies have so much oversight, the board, outside auditors, uh, comp consultants, there is a lot of oversight and there's a lot of ways of evaluating whether your board is in the ballpark of the market, which is very strong support for the business judgment rule, which is how you're ultimately evaluated. So in my career, I've been uh, sued as a board member a gazillion times, always by, um, you know, the, the plaintiff's bar that loves to sue companies anytime there's a hiccup. And I've never even had my deposition taken. I've never seen the paperwork. The DNO carriers come in and just handle it. And if you're doing a good job on a good board, your risk is is actually about as low as, as it could be given that you're, you know, running a lot of money through a company. So um, but I think where uh where if you look at where boards have gotten in trouble, it's that they have gotten kind of lazy uh and they have probably too much confidence in um, the CEO telling them and everything is okay. Uh, and particularly if you have a really long running successful CEO in an industry that's going through exogenous change and the CEO is telling you everything is just dandy, that's kind of when your, your antenna should go up and you should dig a little deeper to see, you know, is there something that looks unusual? And almost always in these cases, um, as, as the dirt has come out, there have been some real flags that the board missed. So it's it's also a, a reason to refresh the board. Make sure the board is not uh, too invested in the existing management, you know, where they would defend them because they're friends, that sort of thing. That that can be a bit of a problem area. I, I say that's that's mostly what I've seen. How about you, Phoebe? Um, you, you know, I think from the broader risk, I would agree with Mary. Um, in general, 
the risks, I mean, obviously they're the risks that we've talked about in terms of litigation risk, regulation, uh, et cetera. Um, there's also, you know, a set of risks, cybersecurity, operational risks, um, uh, investor, you know, activism risks, other things that are out there that 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 you think about. But whether it's a public or a private company board, one of the key risks that I think, you know, boards are really charged with overseeing, not executing, is sort of the strategic direction, being able to see around corners, anticipate what the implications of particular courses of action or options are, and really being able to pull those out so that they're thoughtfully addressed. And in that context, I think those risks sometimes get, um, let's say they, there's a lot of premium placed on, on board members who can help um, manage and mitigate those sorts of risks from a management standpoint. And those are really just as important in many ways to the, the success of a business um, and a company as as the um, other you know financial um, and legal risks that we've talked about. I think that's a very key point. I know there's also some uh, just really quick. There's some fun studies that look at like what happens to board members after the company has a restatement or gets targeted by the SEC. Um, what you see is that for most of the board members, really nothing, obviously, um, for, and certainly they're not being named at SEC actions or paying, you know, substantial amounts or anything like that. But you do see a lot of audit committee turnover. And that for, you know, companies that get targeted or are subject to a restatement, you do see abnormally high turnover for those directors. And also they seem to be less likely to get a future board seats. That's oh, a rather good point. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, we're at, at almost uh, the quarter, quarter past the hour. And um, this has been so much fun. I really appreciate it. I'm glad that we are recording this because I want to go back and just re listen to um, all of the wonderful information you guys have shared. Um, again, for those of you who have um, stayed with us, there will be an email um, the email will actually have um, a lot of the resources that we have mentioned on this and um, on this webinar, and a lot of the information is also in the chat. Uh, thank you all in the audience for joining us, and thank you again, um, Colleen, Phoebe, and Mary. Um, we are so fortunate um, that you guys have joined us, and um, thank you for making this a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. Bye, everyone. Bye. Happy holidays.